All righty. It looks like we have everyone together. Um, I definitely invite anyone that feels comfortable to go ahead and turn on your screens. We will have a fun and interesting and intimate evening tonight. Uh, for our guests that are returning, welcome back. I see some familiar faces and definitely some familiar names, which is great. Um, for those that are new to these events, this is a part of our Summer Artist Series, and this is a platform for us to continue just bringing you exciting and culturally enriching and entertaining experiences with some really talented and creative alumni. My name is Kim Edwards, and I am one of the Art and Culture Co-Chairs of the UVA Alumni Board here in Washington, D.C. This evening, we have Dr. Melanie Adams, who currently serves as the director of the Smithsonian Anacostia Community Museum. Before joining the Smithsonian, Melanie served as the deputy director for learning initiatives in Minnesota Historical Society, where she oversaw the state's 26 historic sites. Prior to Minnesota, Melanie spent 12 years at the Missouri Historical Society as the Managing Director for Community Education and Events. With her vast career, she has worked and overseen over 700 community programs. She has collaborated with events spanning over 100 community partners. Not only is she dedicated in bringing stakeholders together, but she is relentless in addressing community relevant issues. And we definitely welcome her here tonight. So welcome, Melanie. Thank you, happy to be here. It's so good to see you. I think yeah. everyone is very excited. <laughs> great, great. So I will definitely let everyone know that um, we will allow everyone to have an opportunity to ask questions via the chat. Um, you can chat me directly as we go through the program. Uh, Melanie, I'm just thrilled to hear about you and what you've been doing and really the current work at the museum. Um, I believe you have a PowerPoint. To I kind of do. I do. That. Let me kind of share my screen here. Yes, please. Great. So um, first, thank you again for inviting me. I am so excited to be here and talk to my fellow UVA alums. Um, in a perfect world, we'd be doing this in person and then you'd all be sitting with me at the Anacostia Community Museum. Um, but until that day, hopefully um, the pictures will suffice. Um, I'm not sure how many people on the call have been to the museum, but we are located in um, Southeast DC. So we're over in Ward 7. Um, and the museum itself was actually founded um, back in 1967. So one of the things that um, people are always interested in, the museum has always been a Smithsonian. So we were founded by the Smithsonian in 1967 which if you think about your history, what else was going on in the country during that time um, is very similar to what's going on now in terms of the racial unrest and the demonstrations in the streets. And so the secretary at the time thought it was really important to um, create a community museum specifically for the African American community in a DC neighborhood. So the Anacostia neighborhood was selected um, and our first site was, at, was actually down on what is now called MLK um, Avenue. And that first few years, um, it was interesting. They originally thought that the museum would have exhibits from the museums on the mall. So from American history, air and space, all the museums you would go to on the mall. And it would be a way to push people from Ward 7 and 8 to go over and see the museums on the mall. But the director at the time, John Kennard, who was the founding director, had other ideas. And he said, no, we want to tell our stories. We want to tell the story specifically of the African-American community um, and the people of Ward 7 and 8. And so the Anacostia Community Museum really became um, a model for neighborhood museums moving forward. So a lot of your neighborhood museums that you see around the country were really based on the work of the Anacostia Community Museum. So ACM, um, by the numbers, people always ask kind of our basic numbers. Our budget's roughly 3 million. Um, our attendance is um, roughly between 35 and 38,000. Um, so a little smaller than our colleagues on the mall, um, but still um, really impactful. We have a staff of about um, 12 to 14 people at any given time, so small but mighty. 
and we are a collecting museum. So we didn't start out as a collecting museum, but we um, back in the early 90s, we started collecting. And so we roughly have um, 3000 items in plus in our collection. Um, and the thing to remember is we did actually start as an African American museum. So one of the things we like to say is that we were the Smithsonian's first um, African American museum. Um, but over time, we've really transitioned to be more of a diverse community museum. So welcoming in um, all communities and telling their stories, not just the African American community. So um, our mission and vision, both of these were um, reimagined before I arrived back in May 2019. Um, but our actual vision um, is urban communities activate their collective power for a more equitable future. And together with local communities, the Anacostia Community Museum illuminates and amplifies our collective power. And both of these are really important because when I think, when most of us think about museums, these aren't the type of missions you think of. You think of usually collect, preserve, and share. Um, and we do that as well, but we thought it was really important that we talk about the community and specifically around the vision of how are we creating a more equitable future for all. So that is really what we're focusing on moving forward. So the one project, we have a ton of things going on, so I encourage you to visit our website, but the one project I really wanted to just um, talk briefly about tonight and encourage you to participate in is our Moments of Resilience. So Moments of Resilience was a project that we thought of um, kind of right after the pandemic started. And it was an opportunity for us to encourage people to share stories of how they were being resilient during this time. Um, because we knew there were so many great stories out there, um, whether it's first responders, whether it's teachers, I mean, just so many wonderful people doing great work and being resilient. So we invited the community to share their stories, either images, writing a story, videos, kind of whatever they would like to do. So we've been collecting those. But then after the killing of George Floyd, we've also gone on to include moments of resilience related to the recent racial unrest that's happening in our country. Um, and so kind of combining the two, like how are we being, I feel like it's just the, how are we being resilient in the year that is 2020 <laughs> at this point. Um, but so that is still going on and that's an opportunity and it's open for people around the world. We have some great submissions from people pretty much all over the country, a few inter international ones, um, but this can be found on our website and a great way to participate um, no matter where you live. Um, the other thing I'll talk briefly about, so as with most museums, we obviously have exhibits um, and the exhibit um, that we have coming up, which will open on December 19th, um, it is our goal to be open at that time, um, is an exhibit called Men of Change, Power, Triumph and Truth that looks at the identity and stories of African-American men, both famous and um, not so famous, but still with really important stories to share. And so this exhibit is something that um, I was really happy to bring to the museum because of its relevancy to what's happening. And now our ability to be able to talk about African-American men and identities and what's happening in, their com in the communities right now around them. So this is just something to kind of look out for if you're in the DC area um, opening on December 19th. Um, and I should remind people, as with all Smithsonian's, we are free, so there's no entrance fee or anything. You're welcome to just come on in. And I have all my contact information on the slide. Um, and I really love this image. This is just members of the staff and volunteers um, before the annual MLK Day Parade. So it was funny, it was cold for DC. It wasn't cold for Minnesota, it was cold for DC. It was like 35 degrees and they were bundled. So I'm like, okay. Um, but so this is just kind of an example of how we made sure we're involved in the community. So that is all I have for my presentation. Well, thank you for that. It um, really sparked some questions I have in my mind, but I'll, I'll hold them because I really want to speak to what you've been doing, um, even though your time at the Anacostia Community Museum um, has not been as um, lengthy or robust as your time in previous locations, the work and the initiatives you've created are, are excellent. Um, it seems like you've been able to create that sense of representation and amplification of individuals that are in the community, but also maintain that authenticity of history right 
um, the way that museums interpret the world is by what they see and what they um, empower and embrace and then present to the world to come see. Um, you mentioned the Men of Change, mm -hmm. that initiative. Um, I really would love to know what other ways have you all kind of taken what's going on in the world, mm -hmm. both um, socially and um, financially, um, and been able to bring note to what is culturally relevant. Right. Well, and I think, you know, six months from now, no one thought we would be in this situation. So it's kind of new to all of us. Um, so I think after the first few weeks, you know, everyone's shocked that we're still at home. So we need to start doing stuff. Um, so we created actually a series called Take Time Thursdays, um, which is very similar. I think uh, before we started, we were talking about kind of these brief 30 minute programs that really were aimed at people just taking time for themselves. So these were really, um, I would call them light programs in the sense of it's things like it might be 30 minutes worth of yoga or it might be 30 minutes worth of deep breathing. We did some healthy eating. Um, we did something on the importance of family meals, but just an opportunity in the middle of the day, um, actually 2 to 2.30 or 2.30 to 3 to just have a, you know, some type of brief interaction. We've had artists um, do a walkthrough of their virtual walkthrough of their gallery and such. Um, so that program has been going really well. We're getting people again from all over the country signing on. And so in response though to this moment in terms of what's happening, and we really look at it as a dual pandemic and looking at the racial inequalities that, have, that COVID-19 has exposed. We know they've always been there. Um, the, we started a program on Tuesdays called Inspire Action, which really focuses on, again, still only 30 to 45 minutes, but inspiring people to act on this information that they're learning. So these are looking at issues related to inequality. It could be food, it could be housing, it could be transportation, just all of these different topics related to inequality based on race. And so those programs, um, we just started those in July, so those are a little newer but they're still being really well received. So I think those two programs, along with um, moments of resilience is how we're really responding to this moment at the time. And one of the things I will like to add, so you know, I'm, I get to build on the wonderful foundation and reputation of the Anacostia Community Museum. And so I always like to say, um, African-American museums and community museums, we're not responding because we've always done this work. We've always done work around community, around issues of race, around issues of identity. So I hate when people make it sound like, oh, you're just doing this because this event happened. It's like, no, we do this type of thing all the time. I definitely agree with you. I was gonna say that the term you used, um, the dual pandemic was actually one of my questions to really highlight that exactly what you're saying. Um, the COVID-19 pandemic has really more shine a light on and amplified pre-existing issues and concerns that, like you said, were already being addressed, exactly. but now has somewhat of a, a higher platform Correct. Really, um, than perhaps before or um, kind of some ups and downs in history um, mm -hmm. where it has definitely been at the forefront. Um, with that said, I think um, I have a follow-up question, somewhat on a more personal level. Um, I would say I identify as an African-American female, and I'm assuming you do identify the same way. Um, with that lens, what do you think you are bringing um, with a little bit of that intersectionality, you know, being right. African-American, a female, working in um, a community that is strong and rich with that culture? Well, and I think one of the nice things, again, just building on the foundation of the Anacostia Community Museum, um, we've had multiple women directors. Um, and so we've always had that space of, um, of intersectionality there. But I think um, what I bring in this moment is really just that ability, ability to see things through multiple lenses. Because um, I think there's so many things going on um, right now in this country. And it's like, how do you focus and determine and prioritize which one is the one you're going to worry about this week? And I think with the museum, that's why I really love our vision around creating a more equitable future. 
that helps give me some type of direction. Okay, this is our focus. This is what we're doing. Um, and even though we're doing an exhibit on African American men, that doesn't mean we don't do programming related to women. You know, so it's it's kind of a mix. You have to kind of figure out how do you how do you make sure you're representing a variety of communities? And I think there are ways to do it so it doesn't look like you're checking off the box because I think history should be seamless um, and the story should be interwoven in a way that it doesn't look like you're uh, box checking. And that's one of the things I think um, we really do well. I, I agree with that. I think looking at the history of the museum and the, the way it's streamlined some um, initiatives that are perpetuate, right? right. They're, through almost every exhibit, every collection. Um, there are certain passions that the museum has that fit with that mission that you spoke to earlier. Um, regarding certain um, artifacts or collections, um, what is the way or the method to which you all determine what you will showcase? Right, and I think really, as with, as with any museum, how you're collecting really should be based on your mission and vision. Um, as I mentioned, we started off as an African American museum, so that is the majority of our collection. Um, as we move forward, um, we really want to make sure we say we tell the stories of everyday people doing extraordinary things. So we're not necessarily, um, we're very different than our colleagues on the mall, and I explain it because they're a national museum. So when you walk through their museum, you expect to see Rosa Parks, you expect to see um, Martin Luther King, um, you expect to see the national figures. When you come to ACM, you're going to see the stories of the everyday people who made, whose change that they um, perpetuated was just as important, but they're not a household name. Um, so what we're looking at for our collecting moving forward is continuing that, but we're also looking at how are we collecting in this moment? Um, so that's really important to us. And so how are we collecting around the unrest that's happening on the streets um, throughout this country? And so we are slowly putting together a small project um, really to be able to reach out into communities. We're focusing specifically on the DC, Maryland, Virginia region, because that's where we're based, but reaching out to organizations and really partnering with them on the collecting process. Because um, one of the things I think sometimes people think we just run out and grab someone's sign and take it and put it in the collection. And that's not how it works. If you don't have the story, but like it's more than just the artifact. It's really the story of the artifact and what story can that artifact tell. And so we want to make sure we're picking stories that 50 years from now when people want to talk about the um, demonstrations or even the pandemic, we have the story. The people behind the numbers is really important. So it's not just this many people passed away, this many people got COVID, all of that. It's really, these are the personal stories of the people and how they persevered during this time. Yeah, I think just to quote you, the people behind the numbers is a really excellent way to identify the why behind a piece and also how, so how it fits in with the, the mission of the entire museum as well as the community, right? And going back to its foundation. Um, we talked a little about the somewhat micro levels of mm -hmm. influence um, with some of the initiatives you already have in place. On more of a macro level, are there any ways to which you all are gaining momentum on your programs or maybe pipelining um, young individuals into the field of, of preservation and history? Right. And I think, you know, I feel like, as you mentioned early on, I've only been there a year and of the year five months, I've been in my house. <laughs> true, very so, true. So, I mean, I think, you know, we did have a few opportunities where we've had interns, but it's been virtual. So I think we really haven't had the opportunity to do the mentoring and pipelining that we would normally do because um, we normally have fellows in the summer. So there are these opportunities, but the pandemic is making them obsolete, at least for this year. Um, but I think what's important, I think how we're going to help remedy that a little bit is the work that um, we'll do with school groups. I feel like that's really important. Because um, if you think about it, no one grows up thinking, I'm going to be a museum director. At most, they may think I'm going to be a curator. They may know what a curator is, but no right. one grows <laughs> up thinking that. And so I think it's getting the idea in people's minds early um, that they can work at museums. And the other interesting thing is there are so many jobs in a museum, everyone thinks curator. 
I'm like, we have accountants, we have marketing people, we have web people, we have educators, we have everyone. So, you know, so expanding people's ideas around what does it mean to work in the museum? What are the different roles? Um, and really being a history museum, I think we also have to help people unlearn the history they were taught. And I say, and it's getting better with each generation, but I have to say, you know, people always say, oh, I hate history. And it's like, well, let's unpack that. What do you mean you hate history? And what they meant was they hated memorizing dates and names and things like that. And it's like, so you don't hate history because you were really excited about this exhibit or you can talk about history that interests you or directly relates to you. So I think that's the other um, obstacle we have to overcome, especially with our school age kids who are like, you know, they come and they're like, I hate history. But if you tell like something like um, men have changed, when you tell them stories about African-American men and Tuskegee Airmen and things like that, then they're like, wow, this might be more interesting than I thought. <laughs> right, exactly. And I think even um, going back to what you said earlier about the speaker series and the Tuesdays and Thursday, um, I know before everyone signed on, I was looking through it myself and it's so robust and so diverse in the topics um, and the age groups to which it right. caters to, which I, I think is fantastic. So like you said, that um, method of kind of getting people of all different facets and different backgrounds to contribute to a museum, the opportunity is there, right? right? And I think, and it's interesting because I think your question around how do you even get into this type of career? How do you think about it? And I must admit, um, you know, this is second career. The first um, 10 years of my career, I was in higher education student affairs. And part of that um, was because I was so involved at UVA um, in university union. And so it was kind of like, you know, your fourth year, I'm like, I have to do something. I guess I'm going to grad school. So went into higher ed, but what I really learned while I was at UVA that um, I still carry with me today, which was really interesting, whereas I remember two classes. So I was in English and African American studies class. My English class, this was like, it was like 200 level Shakespeare. So this class met Monday, Wednesday, Friday, you know, it's that huge survey lecture class and everyone's half asleep. <laughs> but once a week, the professor and his wife worked in the drama department. They would come and do a scene from whatever play we were reading that week. Oh, my. And it was great. Like the whole place was packed because everyone's like, oh, today's the day where they're going to do a scene. <laughs> but to That's back up, in class. <laughs> right. But that got people really engaged. So that was one exciting spot. But the other one was um, taking an African American literature course. And this was fourth year. So this was the upper level one. And I remember like, the, um, the, scene, the class um, final was you essentially had to create some type of dramatic recreation of one of the books. Like, so, I'm, so it's like all of this creativity in terms of how are we telling stories in creative ways versus just that traditional way that most people think and don't, and that doesn't resonate with everyone. So I think UVA just did such a nice job of showing me different ways to tell stories and different ways to engage with communities. Yes, I, I agree. Um, you made me laugh when you said that, but it's so true. It, I love your authenticity. I love it. Um, a question from Ray, if you don't mind me shouting sure. out, Ray. Yeah. Um, Ray asks, do you have any recommendations for creatives, any artists or designers specifically who want to be a part of these social movements and contribute to the historical preservation? but perhaps want to do okay. so in, you know, more of a, a safer, less, you know, at the front line picket, you know, place. Right, right. Um, and that's a really good question. We're actually, um, we're doing a four-part program series around um, demonstrations and how to get involved in your community, because I think when people think of demonstrating, the first thing they always think of is, I need to have a picket sign out there on the front line. And I have to admit, like, I've never, I've attended, I think I've attended a march, but they're not necessarily my thing. That's not how I contribute. And what I like to tell people is if you look at the civil rights movement, they needed people to cook for them. They need people to book the buses. They need people to make the signs. There are so many different roles. And especially now during this time of social distancing, we can really look at, you know, there are other ways to contribute to the social movement. It's writing letters to your legislators. It's all of these different things that don't, um, that don't require you to be out in an unsafe environment. Um, but also it uses different skill sets. Not everyone wants to march. 
And so, and the movement can't only be made up of people that march. <laughs> it has to be made up of a variety of skills. And so I think that's really important because I think in history class, you always learn about the people who are out front. Mm -hmm. um, so, you know, and I also think it's interesting because in history class, at least in high school, they don't really talk about strategy. The civil rights movement has a strategy. They make it sound like Rosa Parks got tired and sat down. That is not the right. correct story. There was strategy behind that. Yes. It wasn't her just getting tired. Yes. So, I mean, I think there was, you know, there was someone behind her with the strategy. So I think, you know, to answer um, Ray's question, there are, there are a variety of different ways you can get involved. Mm -hmm. I, I completely agree with that. And I think specifically for creatives um, in any genre, any medium that you choose, um, the example I can think of is even in DC right now, the murals. So a right, lot yeah. of times um, pictures or images are captured there. Um, but something you said sparked my mind about um, my, my mother, who is a very different personality. Picketing was her thing. <laughs> Um, not so much my personality, but she would always say, someone's got to tell that story. Someone's got to show you what was left when all those people are gone. Right. So a, a big part of that is really, like you said, all those aspects of how are we capturing this moment for that next generation? Right. It's documenting. I mean, there's some wonderful photography that's happening in the DC region, um, so just so many different ways that it's being captured. And I think, you know, these are one of the first times where, and actually maybe more with Ferguson, when um, was things are now born digital. So, you know, it's like, how do you save things like, um, like Twitter feeds and Facebook accounts and things like that, that are also another place where these stories are being shared? You're exactly right. Um, speaking of Twitter and social media, uh, DC and the, the metropolitan area in general is so transient, um, for better, for worse, right? We, people come, people go, um, but people leave their mark because it is also a place of strong opinions, strong movements, um, strong desires to make change. You know, even the world right now is somewhat of a nation of change, so to speak, right. at this time. Um, how do you think that aspect of, especially going from Minneapolis to here, um, changes or impacts a museum, especially a community museum. Right. Well, I think the big difference is when I look at my colleagues on the mall, they really get more of a tourist population. So if you're a tourist, you know, you are going to go to the museums on the mall. If you get to Anacostia, I always joke, it's maybe your third or fourth visit to DC. And that's only because someone recommended it. Um, whereas I see with us, we have more repeat visitors in terms of just like you said, it's community members. It's people looking for our programs, looking for our space. Um, so we're more aimed at people who are not as transient because being exactly where we are, there are generations of people that lived in Anacostia, Barry Farms area. Um, so we're more grounded within, um, I guess, place versus our, um, the larger national museums. It really is more for, for tourists or they get more tourists um, than we would get. Right. Right. Um, we do have a question from Becca, and I, I will let you answer because it's your show. Um, for the viewers, um, Melly and I both are also neighbors, so we live right. in the same community. Um, right. <laughs> so I suspect you have a lot of um, thoughts for this question that Becca wrote. Um, yes. So, what, um, yeah. yeah, so what Becca is talking about, the Smithsonian um, launched a new race community and our shared futures initiative. Um, so this was announced probably about four weeks ago now. So we're still putting our, we're still putting some shape and definition around it. But essentially, um, the Smithsonian needs to be at the forefront of this national conversation on race that's happening. And so how are we using our resources? And people, when you think of the Smithsonian, people only think of the museums and the panda. So <laughs> there are a few more things than the museums and the panda, though we love the panda. Um, but, you know, there are research centers. We have centers all around the world. So how are we taking all of our resources to bear on this, on such an important um, topic that's facing our country right now? And so ACM, luckily, we, we've always done programs related to race. I think, I like to think everything we do has some type of racial component. And so our contribution is really how are we contributing to the work that is already happening 
And in terms of new initiatives, um, we are looking at kind of looking at programming that we'll do up to 2026. So 2026 is the 250th anniversary of our country. And so I think everyone in the history world and probably museum world are thinking, how are we going to commemorate that? What is that going to look like? And I know for ACM, and this ties into our race, community, and shared future initiative, because we're really looking at something I'm calling um, Transforming America, which will be a five-year project. Each year, we're focusing on a different year, um, a theme year related to racial inequality. So 2021, um, our focus is on food inequality. Um, 2022, I think we're probably going to do housing. Then we're going to have the environment. Um, we'll have education. Um, and then we'll do mental health. But that leads us to 2026. And then what does that look like? So it's this idea of really turning inward to look at ourselves as a country for the next five years and the racial inequality that we're seeing in all of these different areas. And then by 2026, what are we going to do about it? And I think the important part is you will never say why, well, hopefully, you won't hear most people saying that we are celebrating the founding of our country. Because, you know, you have to think about, like, for what you call a celebration, other people don't see as much to celebrate about. Um, so that's why, at least I use the term, we're commemorating um, the founding of the country. Thank you. Thank you for that distinction, too. Um, I think it goes within the same lines of when people say equality versus equity and the, right. the deep-rooted reasons for making that distinction, right? Mm -hmm. um, I won't ask my next question because that was my next question <laughs> of the long-term, maybe five, six-year plan of the museum, knowing that you all are, have quite a few initiatives um, that are going on currently, of course, virtually, but had started before um, the pandemic. So well, and I the, think, mm -hmm. yeah, like one, I just wanted to mention because it's not one that a lot of um, history museums, especially community museums do, is we do have a really robust environmental program. So we're going on 12 years now with our environmental program. And we are adding, um, we have two things that we've added. The first is we've actually added a CO2 monitor out in our museum property okay. to be able to talk about air quality in the DC region. And the nice thing about that, it's in conjunction with a PhD student at GW, but he's placed them all over the region. So it'll be really interesting as we start doing programs when you're able to tell the difference in air quality based on the ward you live in. And who do you think air quality is probably a little worse? And what does that mean for underlying conditions and health and all of these different things? So that's really exciting. And the other thing is we're um, building a new community garden. So we have a small community garden bed, but I think you know we've been saying with everything that's happening, we wanna build something larger. So we're gonna have a larger, community garden bed that we're going to um, begin working on this September. So that'll be great. And this will all be in conjunction with the new exhibit we're opening next summer called Food for the People, which looks yes. at food, history, yes. culture, and justice in the DC mm -hmm. region. So all of this is building up to that new exhibit. That's fantastic. That was actually on my list, oh, on my personal list <laughs> of things to look out for, um, especially in this time um, where things are changing so much in this area. Um, I would actually expand it a little bit past Word 7. I think Word 7 and Word 8, eight. specifically um, have been just on the forefront of commissioners, of philanthropists, of um, the horticultural, right. excuse me, horticulture. And I really think that speaking to educating, uplifting, and providing access to healthy food options in the area is just number one on the list of ways to really change and improve the lives of the community. Right. And I think, and one of the interesting things that we have as part of the exhibit is there actually is a map that shows kind of the grocery stores in wards seven and eight versus the grocery stores in the rest of the wards. And I think, I think it specifically looks at um, not ward six, one of one or two, just showing the sheer density of grocery stores versus in our ward. And I know, I don't know if you're like me, half the time I have to go over into ward six. I have to cross over to the other side of the river to and make that to, walk. Mm -hmm. Right, to go to a good grocery store. And so I think COVID-19 just so exposed that for people, especially when um, 
you know, when they started really monitoring or limiting the number of people that could go and all of these different things, and you only had two grocery store options in your ward. Um, and so I think it's just so, it'll be such a relevant um, experience because I think, you know, unfortunately COVID may be with us for a while, um, but really talking about the food injustices that we've seen or that have been exposed because of COVID-19. I agree. I agree. It sounds like the, there are so many great things going on um, in your museum and around it. Um, even the partners that you all have chosen um, were, sound very thoughtful and purposeful, which is great. Um, I use the term great because I want to know from your perspective, what makes a museum good versus great? Oh, that's a good question. I've never gotten that question. That's a good one. Um, I would say, so a museum that's good is one that's doing what it's supposed to be doing. So collect, preserve, share. You're good, you open your doors, people roam through, they see something that's good. I think what makes a museum great is when they actually engage with their community and when they become almost a community hub or a community center. And so when your museum is the first place people look, if they're like, what's going on? We have a free weekend. What's going on at the Anacostia Community Museum? Is there a program? So I think what makes a museum great is people want to be in your space. They want to engage with you um, and they really see themselves in your, place, in your space. Um, they don't feel like they're visiting someone else's history or they don't see their stories being told. So I think, I think that's the difference. And I think more museums are shifting or trying to shift towards great because they recognize that they can no longer tell a story, um, a one-sided story. So they're, you know, they need to look at stories through multiple lenses and they need to understand, you know, the great TED talk around the danger of the single narrative. Yeah. Um, too many museums start the story in a certain place where you're like, of course, this group looks bad based on where you started the story. <laughs> if you go back a few decades, you'll see why this happened. Um, so, but I think museums are trying, but I think, you know, museums like the Anacostia Community Museum, again, this is what we've always done. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I think with the sphere of culture, and the notion of making an impact, a long-standing impact. You as a director, what impact or legacy do you wish to leave at the museum when you move on maybe to something else right. or retire? Uh, right. <laughs> I want to make sure when I leave that I left, that I leave it better than I found it, which is, I think, you know, every leader says that. But um, I also think it's my role to make sure that I have trained really great museum staff. Like so many people think, oh, it's horrible if your people leave. And I'm like, not if you train them well, because hopefully they're going out and making other museums better. And they talk about how, what a great experience they had it working for you. Um, mm -hmm. So I think that's really important, especially in the museum field, um, as we're talking about how do we diversify the field. So I really feel, you know, one of the most important things I can do is actually hiring. Mm. You know, so how am I hiring? How am I getting, how am I putting people in positions to be successful? Okay. Um, and so I like to see former colleagues and people I've worked with doing really well, doing really innovative programming and just really enjoying their work. So I would think that's, that's really what I would see as my legacy. That's great. That's great to hear. Um, I think my next question within that same vein is in that hiring process and thinking about expanding. So this current state is a perfect example, expansion to virtual and perhaps using it as a, a long-term uh, method to connect, right? With individuals that may not physically wanna to come to the museum or may be in that Virginia or Maryland area, but might have grown up in this area or region. How do you plan on maintaining that sense of attention and engagement with those individuals? Well, I think it's really important. People, people respond to and engage with places, again, where they feel like their stories are being told. They feel like they're being valued um, and their humanity is being valued. And so I think um, 
that's one of the things that's going to be really important moving forward. I think Anacostia, we have loads of room to grow. Um, right. But I also like to think of it as I don't, our success is not based on our numbers because, you know, one of the things I tell my staff, we are never going to win the numbers game with the, um, with the uh, museums on the mall. We're not getting millions of people through our small space, nor do we want millions of people. Um, so how are we evaluating success? And I think it's evaluating or how we should evaluate success is how are we engaging with people in our community? So, and you know, we use community broad. I remember, you know, of course the DMV. So until you move here, you think the DMV means something else. Um, right, exactly. But essentially, you know, how are we engaging with the community, diverse communities within the DMV and are we making meaningful, meaningful connections is I think how I'm gonna really look at judging the success of the work we're doing. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you, thank you for that. It looks like we have a question from David. Okay. Uh, well, David, and then follow up with Ray's question. Okay, so have I been in DC long enough to begin to draw any conclusions about the impact of congressional oversight of the district and home rule on the development of Anacostia and the city? I have not. I mean, it's interesting because coming from St. Louis, um, the, the, the way I can compare it a little bit, so in St. Louis, which this is really weird, um, in the Civil War, the state took over St. Louis City's police department because Missouri is a border state. So it was the northern state with slavery. And so they were afraid that the um, city would end up um, fighting for the south. Like it was all very convoluted. But essentially, the state took over the city police department and didn't give it back. And so it was that home rule concept of um, locally being able to run your own police department. Um, and so that was very similar in terms of seeing what's happening here in DC and home rule in terms of being able to um, run, your own, um, run your own departments and things. The other example, again, which is another St. Louis one, St. Louis is very similar to Baltimore in the sense that St. Louis city is not within St. Louis County. And again, there was home rule, um, implications there as well. But here in DC, it is, it's interesting. People, when I first moved here, were saying there's DC and there's Washington. And you have to kind of know the difference. Yeah. And now living here, I understand what they mean. Like Washington is more of the federal. It's what you see on television. It's the touristy part. And then there's DC, which are the communities and the people and knowing the locals and things like that. And so I feel like I haven't gotten as great of a feel yet again, because I said, you know, I've been stuck in the house for five months. <laughs> oh, you know, so it's, it's a little harder to get out and about, but I am kind of looking forward to learning a little bit more about the intricacies and, you know, being a quasi government um, entity ourselves, just learning about how all of that impacts us. Thank you. So another one from Ray. How do you respond to well-intentioned staff who want to explore new topics in different ways and expand storytelling, but worry that, okay. Um, well, first of all, no one gets everything 100% correct. Um, I think one of the things I find is that people assume it's a no and never ask. And the way I will flip Ray's question around a little bit is you get a lot of people who say, oh, we can't talk about that. That's too political. Every, and I said, everything is political. Right, everything, is life is political at this point. <laughs> but even people said that though, even outside of DC, like, oh, we can't talk about redlining because that's political. It's like, but it's the truth. If the area was redlined, that has nothing to do with politics. That has to do with history. And so I think it's not being afraid to tell the story as you know it at the time with as much information as you have, but be willing to be to be willing to listen and open if there are other ideas. Um, but I think it's really important, you know, a lot of times when we're talking about museums, people have to acknowledge that people come to programs or exhibits with certain bias. And you admit those biases and you make sure you're learning through them. And if you're telling the story in a certain way, make sure you're talking to the right people. And I say that too many times museums told stories about people as opposed to with people. So how do you do an exhibit on like African-American artists and not have any African-American artists involved? Know. Um, so yeah. it, you know, it goes back to, I think, you know, one of your original questions around who's telling your story and who gets to limit themselves. 
But I think, you know, Ray is connect. It's correct. People do limit themselves out of fear or cancer culture, and they're so hesitant to do anything. And so one of the things, um, you know, I've had some great um, leaders and mentors. I think, you know, one of my first, I would say, um, would be Greer Wilson, who was the um, director uh, of stu student activities when I was at UVA, who was this powerhouse African-American woman. And one of the things I learned from her was always pick your battles, which was really important. Mm -hmm. um, but I think as I've moved on with other leaders, one of the things I feel is really important is, you know, I always, I used to joke with my staff, I haven't said this to this staff, but I've said it to others, you know, there are three things you need to tell me. Have you pissed off a board member? Have you hurt, harmed a child? Have you broken artifacts? Those are the three things I need to know right away. <laughs> I kind of trust you, you know, so, you know, anything that, you know, that translates to anything that may be in the paper, you probably want to give me a heads up, um, because then it's easier for me to support you. Mm -hmm. You know, nothing is worse than having a microphone put in your face, and they're like, you know, did you know your staff did this? And you're like, oh, they did. Okay, I guess we're figuring that out. But if I'm prepared, I know. So, you know, it's lines of communication and just being prepared for that. Thank you. That that's so true and great words of wisdom. I think <laughs> it sounds like you have such great experience with different types of staff and different types of societies that you've worked in. I I would imagine working in the different places in the Midwest versus here lend themselves to different tackles or different um, challenges, so to speak. Could you name one or two challenges that you've encompassed or encountered here aside from the COVID pandemic right. that you did not expect when moving here? Well, I know it's interesting. I always can tell people this is like moving home since I went to UVA. So, you know, I'm used to the South and I'm from New Jersey. So I'm an East Coaster. So it was stranger to be out in the Midwest. And then when I moved to Minnesota, it was so funny. They're very adamant. They are not the Midwest. They are the upper Midwest. So yes, everyone is so geographically sensitive, but yes, they are the upper Midwest. Um, and so I think it was just coming back here felt very natural, very normal. There was nothing, you know, and I think it's even, you know, Becca didn't know there were, like, I feel like I'm surrounded by UVA alums. Like, I think we were having this conversation before we even got on. When I was in the Midwest, when I would see a UVA t-shirt, I'd get all excited. I'd have to go chat with the person, all of this. Here, you can't do that because you're going to see one every third person. <laughs> and so um, it really wasn't that much of a transition in terms of moving back to East. Great. Well, that is surprising, but it's good to hear. And I did <laughs> not know you're from Jersey. I don't know how I missed that. <laughs> yes. Yes. Born and raised. So. <laughs> well, I think we have time for about two more questions. Okay. So Becca. we have Becca again. Let's see. Mm -hmm. What do you think? is um, ACM's role response in addressing or speaking to other forms of racism. For example, with COVID-19, there's been, a, oh, okay, yep, xenophobia towards Chinese people and Chinese Americans and Asians as a whole. And so really, we're actually partnering. We have grants from APAC, which is our Asian Pacific American Center, as well as our Latino Heritage Center, where we're actually working with them on both, um, on topics related to food insecurity and our food exhibit. And we're actually working with our um, Hispanic Cultural Center around Hispanics related to healthcare and COVID-19. Um, so we do work closely um, with the other communities within the Smithsonian, but really, again, as we're trying to be a community-based museum, we really want to make sure we're talking to the experiences of the broad community and not focusing on one specific community. That makes sense. Thank you for that. And it's good to hear the, the broad spectrum of individuals and cultures and identities that you all are supporting. Yes. Mm -hmm. One question I definitely want to ask, and on behalf of the group, if we want to be a part of the community mm -hmm. and may not live in the area, I know I'm very biased as I can walk there. Right. But for those that cannot, what are the best ways for them to either get involved if they have a more creative or um, artistic skill, or if they would like to support monetarily or with resources? Sure. Well, all of the information um, is on our website, so that's a great place to start. 
I would really also consider peop, um, ask people to consider contributing stories to our moments of resilience. Again, that's another way you can um, find us online and contribute the story of how you are um, persevering during this time of COVID and the racial unrest. Um, and in terms of um, just supporting us, I think, as I've mentioned, we have a lot of great programs going on um, virtually, so I'd love for you to join those. And once we're able to actually meet up in person, I look forward to hosting um, the UVA club at the museum. Um, I think that'll be another wonderful opportunity for us to all meet and see each other in person. So I look forward to doing that. Um, but yeah, I think um, there are many opportunities on our website. And since you mentioned donations, I do have to say there is this perception that we get all of our funding from the federal government, which we do not. We still have to raise money. Um, so thank you for that. That is a really important factor since we don't have um, admissions fees. Um, we rely on individual gifts um, as well as sponsorships. Well, thank you. And I always ask that question because I know that there are different ways people can support. And especially during this time, that might be the best way initially before people can get to the actual museum. So thank you for answering that. I think that we all, at least I can say for myself, had a great evening. Oh, um, thank you, it was wonderful. Yes. Thank you for your authenticity and for just enjoying our time together. Um, you are absolutely hilarious and I appreciate <laughs> you that. You're funny. <laughs> um, and just our overall experience in getting a better and deeper understanding of museums, of what you're doing, and especially the programs, some phenomenal programs that you have going on currently and upcoming. So thank you again. I want to um, also just thank the UVA Club of Washington for allowing me to put on this production um, and kind of shift to virtual. I think it's been a, a decent shift and want to continue to give everyone just the time and ability to get to know people that are also alumni. And we have quite a few on uh, from 91 specifically. So that's great. I know, I didn't call them out. I'll just yell at them later. <laughs> Well, feel free if you do want to connect, um, if you all put your emails in, I'm sure Melanie would love to connect with you all uh, in the near future. But for those that enjoyed, let me know, send me an email or a post on our website and we will continue to give you all amazing and just really enjoyable experiences with alumni in the future. So thank you all for your time. Thank you, thank you. Have a good rest of your evening. Thank you, you too.